Hello everyone, welcome back to Black Heaven, a necromantic dating sim. Let's go ahead and continue. When you finally part ways with Izagi, you realize that it's a Thursday, which means you have anatomy class in about an hour. After an hour-long nap in your room, you wake up groggy and dehydrated. You down two cups of water and get ready for class. As you head out the door, your foot steps on something papery. When you lean down to pick it up, it's an origami cow. When you unfold it, you find a note with Lisa's handwriting. Hey Uzo, can you come by my dorm to grab my homework to turn in today? I'm feeling sick and I'm gonna miss class. Doodle at the bottom of the note are two playing cards. A pair of sixes. You smile and shrug. Fifteen minutes later, you arrive at Lisa's dormitory room. You knock on the door and Lisa opens it. She has a white cloth bag pressed against her forehead and one of her eyes is half open. Hey, thanks for coming by. She hands you the papers. Through the crack in the door, you can see a line of liquor bottles on Lisa's bedside table. You look terrible. Is it a fever or something? Nah, it's a bastard of a hangover. If you want to come by after class, I'll be over it. Feel free to copy off me if you want. She shuts the door and hears her shuffle across the room and claps on her bed. You start walking away, but you can't shake the feeling of being an errand boy. When you sit down in the classroom, you compare Lisa's work with yours. With a sinking feeling, you see your answers are different. You start covertly revising your work before class starts. After an hour long lecture on bones, you walk out of the classroom and head back to Lisa's dorm with today's new assignments. You knock on her door again. But you don't get an answer. One of the other doors in the hall opens and Lisa walks out. Oh hey, perfect timing. Just got cleaned up. Is that today's homework? Yeah. You hand her the sheets and she starts looking over them. She scoffs and slaps the papers against her arm. Seriously? I can't have done this stuff hungover. Come on, let's go do something. She opens the door to her room and tosses the assignment on the table, then gathers up a pair of wine bottles. Where are we going? Lise flourishes her wine ball dramatically. To the theater! Lise buttons up her uniform, stashes the balls on the big satchel, pulls on her winter clothes, and then locks up her room and starts walking. You walk alongside her as you head out of the dorm and across campus, toward a towering building that looks like a castle. Are you going to be meeting some of the losers from the bar trip? We'll see if they're any fun. Why would you invite those guys? It's obvious you don't like them. We're paying for our tickets. I love the theater, but I can't spend all my money on going to shows. I need some of that money for booze. Then again, if I ever need pocket money, I can't just set up a little game of cars and give you a call, right? I'd rather not build a reputation for being a cheater. Oh, you've already got a reputation, didn't you hear? The mysterious dark card shark from the sticks who goes toe to toe with Izagi Ido every day. You let out a surprise laugh. What? Who told you that? Oh, word gets around. Tenza is still pissed that you beat him at cards, and no one will let him forget it. He deserves it to be taken down a peg. And Ito has quite the reputation here. All she does is break bones and win faculty accommodations. She has a nice physique, but everyone's terrified of her. I can understand the last part. She can be really intense. 
Once you get past that, though, she's okay. Oh, it sounds like you and her are getting to be close. Are you winning her over? <laughs> I wouldn't say that. She and I had a confrontation recently. We sorted some stuff out. Really? Do tell. Did she put you in the headlock? You hesitate before telling Lise what happened. You get the feeling that whatever you say is gonna find its way to the river mill. We had an argument, but we solved it. She can't get under your skin, but I respect her. She's just not a very patient person. Lise looks at you, waiting for more. When it comes clear that you're not gonna say anything else, she shrugs. Okay, if that's all. Either way, people are starting to talk about you, Mr. Gravedigger. And of course, I've been helping. Helping? How? You'll see. Hey, there you are. Please rush us toward a girl standing near the entrance to a theater. You recognize another girl from the bar, as well as Tenzo. One of the girls you don't recognize sidles up to Lise and whispers something to her while looking at you. You look away and find Tenzo gazing at you. You offer a handshake, but he leaves it hanging in the air. Lise takes her everywhere, huh? Guess so. Did you walk here or did you take your magic fucking carpet? At the corner of your eye, you notice several other people from the group listening for your response. Just walk. Tenza looks at you, his eyebrows raised. He shrugs and looks towards Elise, who is walking over from the ticket booth. Let's go! You walk through the main doors and into the lobby, where a giant chandelier hangs overhead. The room seems more akin to a ballroom than a lobby, but Lise it leads the group straight to the stage before you can look around. Let me take a good look at this background. Ah, it's really pretty. You walk into the theater itself and find a row near the back. It's mostly empty, but there are a couple other students in front. You settle into your seat next to Lee's. Everyone else clusters around you. Tenza sits directly behind you. As the play opens with a swell of strings and horns, Lee takes out the bottles of wine and passes them around. Want some? You take a short sway from one of the bottles, mostly for show, and hand it back. When the ball passes the Tenza, you can hear him take a pull and feel him rest the ball on your head. You're a pretty good coaster, Uzo. You swipe away the ball with your hand, but Tenza returns it to the same spot. Getting a little up before a table, aren't we? You turn around in your seat and glare at Tenza, looks back at you magnanim magnanimously. Someone asks for the wine. And he lifts it from your head and hands it over, still looking at you. You turn around and face the stage again. When Lise notices you're gripping your arm wrist, she taps you on the shoulder and points at the stage. Who's prettier, her or her? Both actresses are singing a duet. One of them is wearing an elaborate gold dress, while the other one is in scarlet red. You point at the one in the gold dress. Ha! <laughs> that's a guy! You frown and gaze more closely at the actress. She does indeed have a lump in her throat. The play, as far as you can tell, is about two beautiful sisters who fall in love with the same swordsman. The swordsman is comically straight-laced and retired, and refuses romantic advances to focus on the sword. The sisters try a number of tactics to trick him into falling in love with them, but he always refuses. Finally, in the middle of the second act, when the sisters is revealed to be a man and chaos ensues. It's hard to really pay attention, since Lise and her friends spend the whole time talking. By the intermission, 
several members of the group are slurring their words. Lee's, however, seems unaffected by the wine. As the curtains close for the intermission, Lee's gets up and slides by you to get to the aisle. Before walking to the exit, she leans down and whispers in your ear. Follow me out in 60 seconds. You glance at her, and she taps the side of her nose before walking away. You sit in your seat, listening to drunken rambling and laughs from Lisa's friends. You count to 36. Where did Lisa go? Who's up? Don't know. I think she went to her washroom. Fuck. Or right, lying. You then an extra 20 seconds to your count, then stand up and walk back to the exit. You cross the lobby and find Lee sitting in the chair. Hey ya! Can he then follow you? Don't think so. Tenzo asked about you. Oh, screw that guy. He's been after me since we met. Come on, let's go to balcony level. Wait, we're just leaving those guys? Yeah. I thought the new girls would be fun when they're drunk, but they're just bores. The guys aren't so either. She starts to walk up the stairs to the balcony level, and you follow behind her. You find new seats in the back row of the upper balcony, Lee's leans forward to watch the play. When we were walking here, you mentioned you had uh, helped my reputation. What does that mean? Lee's looks down at the play, apparently entranced by the singing of the actress in red. Well, the fact that you knew about skull lanterns caused some murmurs. When I heard you worked in the cemetery, I went off that. What do you mean? Some people were joking that you killed somebody, and I decided to tell them something different. I said you weren't a murderer. You just buried the bodies for some crime family. What? Why'd you tell them that? It's all just gossip, Uzo. No one's gonna haul you away on criminal charges. Besides, it's already made you popular among the girls. They all think you're a brooding man, Mr. You pause. It might not be the worst thing in the world if people fear you a little. Fear and respect are good. But then again, rumors have a bad habit of taking a life of their own. I wish you would have told me about this before. I don't know how I should act. Do you want me to stop telling people that stuff? Hmm. Well, let's add to our reputation. No, it's fine. I just want to be in control of my own reputation. In fact, you lean forward and rest your elbows on your knees, so you can lose his face. Why don't we, uh, sweeten the narrative a bit? What if, during my time as a grave digger at the cemetery, let's say I saw something I shouldn't have, and this crime family they buried me alive? Please turns to you and her eyes light up. Oh, that's good. Let's see, I managed to dig myself out. That's when they decided to hire me as their go-to digger. Lee's claps her hands together and leans close to you, her mouth wide and mock shot. That's so creepy, it's perfect. Can I say you told me that? Sure, just make it subtle. Maybe I... You lean back in your seat and steep like your fingers. As you're contemplating something dark and grisly, was sitting there in the dark of the theater, and you asked about the grave digger thing. I will turn to you. You turn your head slowly to Lee's with a grim expression. Lee's covers her mouth and slaps her chest, barely able to stifle her laughter. And I said, they made me dig my own grave first, then I told you the story. Lee's puts a hand on her forehead and pretends to faint. Oh, the gruesome tale. This is fantastic. Better than what I could come up with. An hour later, 
you at least are still trading jokes and embellishing the Gravedigger story. Play ends and everyone filters out, but you at least stay in your seats until the ushers come. Make sure the rest of the group is gone, and start walking back to campus. It's a beautiful afternoon, edging toward evening. You walk at least to her dorm and she turns to you. She holds her hands behind her back and gives you a brilliant smile. That was fun, a lot of fun. Want to do it again sometime? With a change of venue? You run a hand through your hair and let out a big breath. I'll go with you, but I get to be intense as gunning for me. Sure, we can go somewhere out by ourselves. I think I know where to. Until then, don't get into any trouble. Same with you. Please gives a dramatic wave and heads out toward her dorm. The next day, you'd offer to help Rue prepare for a guest lecture. Unsurprisingly, public speaking was one of her least favorite things. When you arrive at her office, Rue is hunched over a written speech. You see her making tiny marks and corrections on the neatly written lines. Oh, hi, Izo. I'll be ready in just a second. I just need to revise the conclusion. No problem. Unfortunately, uh, I haven't had a lot of time to practice speech or even draft it. I've been very busy, so it might not be my best work. This guy is so busy lately. Seems like you're always working on something. My personal research. I've been managing my time as well as I could and well. I follow him a few days. Maybe a week or so. Maybe a little more. I've been falling behind. I need to present my progress to deans in a few weeks. And I really need to finish the more experimental parts of my research. So teachers need to do homework too, huh? I guess you could put it that way. You sit in the mid sack against the wall and fold your hands on your chest. You lean your head back and let your eyes close. A few minutes later, you hear Ruth stand up from her chair and stand in front of a wooden lectern she set up in front of a chalkboard. You open your eyes and try to look attentive. Rue looks about as tense as she can be. Her shoulders are hunched and her face is frowning determinedly. I want you to time me. Just mark the time when you start, and then we'll... I'll see what time it is when you finish. Ready? Yeah. Okay. Who takes a deep breath and shuffles the paper on the lectern. Ray scan the first page silently. Within the study of immortality, the endurance of the body has taken up the majority of attention. The extension of one's lifespan has eclipsed all other objectives, even the augmentation of organs. The prevailing wisdom is that one's life should be as long as possible, no matter the cost. This leaves us with a looming question. What does our practitioner do when they find their body damaged? My research offers the most comprehensive answer yet. The solution is the regeneration of flesh. The regenerating of flesh. With a slightly rocky start, Rue gets into the flow of the lecture and her stuttering gradually dwindles. She seems to keep her eyes on her written notes, however, rather than audience, namely you. When she's finished, her shoulders slump as she's just dropped a huge weight. What's my tank? 13 minutes, 60, 36 seconds. Damn, I was going for 10. Leave the trap. Rue blushes a little as she realizes that she let a curse slip out. But a fierce determined look overwhelms it almost immediately. Can I do it one more time? Then you can tell me about if there's anything you... Ways I can improve it. If 
little strange that your mentor is asking you for permission. As far as you're concerned, you're already pressed ganged into this. Yeah, go ahead, I'll break the time. Okay, alright, less mistakes and talk faster. But in the study of immortality, the endurance of the body has taken up the majority of attention. Damn it, start my time over again. But in the study of immortality, 10 minutes and 20 seconds later, Rue finishes the speech again. Okay, 20 seconds over is fine. I should be able to do that again. It's just the middle part that gets a little difficult. We look at the clock and notice that there's 12 minutes until Rue's lecture class starts. Uh, I think we should start walking over. So it's time for the class to start. Oh, okay. That's not a lot of time, but you will walk with me. I'd like you to give me your feedback on the way over, if it's not too much trouble. You shrug. You don't have much to do in the next class, other than lounge around and study. Sure, let's go. You walk with Rue to lecture hall, talking through the points you'd mentally made while listening. And the big thing is just looking up from your page once in a while to look at the class. If you do that, it makes it seem like you're talking to us. Not just reciting what you've written. You pay more attention. Oh, that's good. Walk into the classroom with Rue and take an empty seat near the back. It feels weird to be here, and I've been supposed to be in this class. You watch Rue organize her notes and speech pages at the front desk. She doesn't greet the class or even look at them. All the other students seem to be watching her intently, unsure of how to gauge her. Rue said that this was a guest lecture, not a normal class she does, so this is probably the first time any of the students have seen her. She writes on, on the primacy of regener regenerative arts on the chalkboard, taking care to space each letter perfectly apart. Finally, a clock in the back of the room chimes and the root clears her throat. Within the study of immortality, the endurance of the body is taking up the majority of at attention. With uh, the extension of one's lifespan has eclipsed all of her objectives, even the augmentation of organs. He wins a little at Rue's delivery. She hasn't even said hello to everyone for giving a preamble to her speech. She seems to have lost sight of everything except delivering her speech, and she's not even doing it that right. The prevailing wisdom is that once existed, uh, life should be as long as possible, no matter the cost. You can hear a quaver in her voice as she stumbles over the words. This leaves us with a alluding uh, question. What does a practitioner do when they find their body damaged? Who glances over to her notes? She includes some of your tips. She seems to remember that she should be looking at the glass once in a while. My research offers. Who looks at the class and trails off. Pants to left and right, and you see her chest begin to heave a little. Her eyes go wide and she stands there, frozen. She stays that way for 5, 10, 15, then 20 seconds. Ooh, come on, you can do it. My research. My. There's a wet ripping sound, and you see Rue's left arm go limp and fall out of sleeve, tumbling to the ground with a thud. Dark stains begin to spread across her jacket as the blood soaks into the fabric. Her Rue doesn't react. She just keeps breathing quickly, her eyes glazed. You watch her reach up with her right arm and wipe the sweat off her brow, but the back of her hand smears and leaves a smear of blood across her face. She looks down at her hand in confusion and horror, and grips the front desk as if to study herself. Suddenly, she collapses sideways and hits the floor. You really stand up from your desk and run over to her. No one else says anything, but moves to help. 
They find Rue on the floor, her mouth moving silently as she stares at nothing. Rue. Rue, what's wrong? What happened? One of her eyes swivels to look at you, independent of the other eye. I'm okay. I'm okay. Her voice is strange. It's like you're hearing it from far away. Like the voice is coming from deep inside her, miles within. Rue suddenly begins to cough, and her body begins curling up from the intensity. She starts to retch, her eyes clenched shut. A spurt of blood comes out of her mouth, and she spits up something on the floor. An eye with a rat tail. That's not how it happens, that's not how it happens. You stand up and walk back to her desk, and sit down. Everything around you is frozen and not moving. You agree. Close her eyes and think to herself. Rue didn't finish her speech. She ran out. This didn't happen. This didn't happen. You open your eyes and find that everything is still frozen. You see Rue silently stand up from the front of class. Her head turns to look at you. Both her eye sockets are empty and there's streaks of dried blood trailing from her mouth. You close your eyes again. Replay the memory in your head. Rue freezing up, taking her papers. You open your eyes to the sound of Rue's quick, light footsteps. You watch Rue walk briskly toward the back of the class, her notes in hand. The speech is still on the desk. She hurriedly pushes to open the door and walks out into the hall, leaving the door open behind her. You wait for a few seconds, still seized by fear. Around you, the class starts to talk among themselves. There's a couple of incredulous laughs and some confused whispering, and then a few students go up to the front desk to look at the speech. You look down at your hands and realize what you've been gripping the sides of the desk with white knuckles. You loosen your grip and try to breathe slowly, but your heart is pounding. You're losing the thread. This stuff didn't happen. Not this way. You catch the scent of ash coming from somewhere and look out the windows, but everything is as it should be. While everyone is distracted, you get up and slip out the door. You step out of the building, take a deep breath of cold, clean air. Your eyes scan the campus, but there's no traces of ash or fires. For a moment, you feel a blank space in your mind. What are you doing here? Haven't you been here before? You can remember what happens next, but when you try to remember beyond that, it gets muddy. You remember going to Rue's office to reassure her after the speech. She was upset. Wait, how do I know what happens next? The chill runs through you. It's like you know how a song goes, but you don't remember all the lyrics. You tried to remember what happened a few minutes ago. It's like the memory of it keeps slipping through your fingers. You remember blood. Did you get a nosebleed in the middle of your speech? Was that it? You shake your head and walk to Rue's office. The memory is gone, but was it even worth remembering? You try to think of what you're going to say to Rue when you get to her office. It's a weird feeling. You're students, but you're thinking about how you're going to reassure your mentor. It's also kind of surreal to see a teacher just freeze up in the middle of a lecture like that. You're supposed to be the one who's in charge, right? You arrive at Rue's office and find that the door is unlocked. You walk inside, but Rue's not behind the desk. You go to the door to her private quarters and knock twice. Please go away. Rue's tone is clipped and business-like. Which makes you all the more worried. You'd expected her to sound upset. Hey, it's me, Uzo. Just wanted to make sure you're okay. Yes, I'm fine. I just... I have a lot of work to do and I'm very behind. So I'd like to talk later. Is that alright with you? So... We're gonna pretend that what happened back there... Didn't happen? There's a long pause on the other side of the door. 
I just... I, I froze up. I, I didn't know what to say. I... I hate... I hate myself for doing it, but in that moment, I just couldn't... I couldn't do it. I can deal with it. They won't fire me. I'm too valuable. My research is too valuable for them. Don't worry about me. I'm going to be okay. I'm just going to get... I don't know. Through the door, you can hear a whisper coming to something to herself. Absolutely pathetic. Let's tell her you don't think less of her. Suggest she go back and finish the speech. Finish the speech, Rue. Hey, 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 it's not too late. You can get back there in a couple of minutes and finish the speech. Maybe you can make an excuse for. Rue interrupts you, her voice loud and upset. No, Uzo, it's over. I can't go back there. I'll deal with what happens. D don't worry about me. Just go study. I have work I need to do. Okay. If you start to say if you need me, but stop yourself. You're not a friend, technically. You're her pupil. Maybe she could keep talking to her, but it sounds like she's too upset to deal with what's happened. Alright. I'll be back next week. You take a few steps away from the door, but you don't leave the office. Instead, you stand in the middle of it and look at Rue's desk. You walk backward quietly and close the door to Rue's office, so it sounds like you left. Then you gaze at your feet, listening. Through the door to Rue's quarters, you hear what sounds like elbows hitting wood and then quiet sobs. You look down at the rug with unfocused eyes. If she were someone your age, she could bang on the door until she lets you in. But she's not. You can't do anything now. She thinks you're gone. I'm not sure why you did that, but maybe you just wanted to see how Ru really felt. It's a strange feeling. To listen to someone else's sobs when they think they're alone. It was wrong. There's something entrancing about it. You've often thought about how people act when they're alone. Some people never take off their masks until there's no one around. You grip the doorknob and turn slowly, silently. Can you still hear Rue's faint sobs? Harvey wants to say something or do something to comfort her. But another part is happy that it's not your responsibility. You're not even here right now. Uzo? You find yourself leaning against the wall in the dojo. Izai is peering at you with concerned expression. Are you alright? Do you need water? No, I'm fine. I've just been tired. I didn't get any sleep last night. I dreamt I was walking up a long staircase. Do you want to keep going? Yeah, sure. You shake your head to dislodge the grogginess and go back to sparring with these ivy. You take your stance, take a deep breath, and start circling her. Both of your hands are wrapped in linen, tied in the special way Zai taught you. This way you won't break your fingers when you strike hard. Alright, show me the step. The diagonal offensive one. You nod and step forward with your back leg, shifting the weight to your front foot as your feet pass one another. As soon as your foot touches down, you shift your weight once more and suddenly step forward again, this time diagonally. It's supposed to be a technique only for advanced students. Mizagi was too patient for you to learn it and decided to teach you herself. Mizagi meets you halfway and lazily blocks your strike and throws a quick counter punch at your chest, which you deflect. Soon your hands are moving complex weapon strikes, locked grips. It's crude and clumsy, 
they can see the parents shining through. Circles, lens, vectors of force, equations of balancing and ba unbalancing. Your hands almost move on their own. Spines ease like touch and pressure. That frees you up to think about your footwork. Schwarn, keep my stance relaxed. Stay balanced on my back foot. You and these Zagi move in a dance that reminds you of the ways of coming in and out. Attack, counterattack, retreat, advance. What's strange is that your eyes never leave each other's faces. You've been learning not to look closely at your opponent's hands, but instead let your eyes relax. Since you're not focusing on Izagi's hands and feet, you can see all of her at once and take in the whole picture. Know vaguely where her legs are based on her stance, the same way you can tell where her hands are based on her shoulders. You can feel yourself grinning, grunting, and frowning with each movement. Izagi's face is carefully controlled. Finally, she breaks her defense and strikes you sharply in the sternum. Then she breaks into a smile. You're, you're too reticent. You didn't come in deep enough with your step and you sabotage your opening. You're too aggressive. You never let up. Even after you lost your footing. If I was a bit better, I could have gotten you then. Izagi raises an eyebrow. That was really sloppy of me. But you can feel that, huh? Good. You're listening to your body. You just have to be bolder. You sigh and roll your shoulders, feeling how the lower burn in your muscles. Being bold against you feels suicidal. Izagi laughs, then quickly covers her mouth and glances around. When she takes her hand away, she's still smiling, just a tiny bit. Come on, try open again. You have to get over being afraid of me. You take your stance and raise your arms once again. Izagi does the same, settling into her stance like a tiger already getting ready to pounce. Whatever your body says is good enough, go one step further, then you'll be close enough. You breathe in and try to relax. You level your eyes on Izagi and feel the weight of her gaze on you. You take one step forward, and another step diagonally, crossing the distance between you and Izagi. In a split second, her face seems to race closer to yours, and your arms crash into hers. When you finish stepping forward, your face is inches from Izagi's. You feel her arms try to slide past yours to strike, but you step so close that they're all bunched up. Izagi takes a swift step back, feeding her arms, and stands up straight. She gives you a wry smile. That's close enough. Gather up, gather up everyone. Yumi Zagi quickly bow to one another, and follow the rest of the class to the front of the dojo. Today we're going to be doing sparring exhibitions within our classes. Juniors will spar with their classmates and junior seniors will spar with their peers. I will be refereeing the matches and offering guidance as I do so. Juniors will restrain their force, but not their technique. Seniors, there are no limits on force, but I will be judging you on your skills, not solely your physical conditioning. Those who do not impress me with their training will not advance. The first student, a junior from your class, is called up and everyone lines up against the walls to watch them. Who wishes to challenge initiate Manawa? Another one of your junior classmates steps forward and raises her hand. Master Izan nods, then motions for them to stand opposite Manawa. The two bow and take up their stances, then Izan chops the air with his hand. Manawa immediately rushes at his opponent, the latter stops his head down and wrestles him to ground. Izan makes a sharp bark to stop, and the two separate. Across the room and it speaks in a low voice, offering clip lessons to both of them. The two go to stand against the wall, and another pair is called forward. Their match lasts slightly longer, with both of them cautiously feeling the other out until one manages to land a chain of spinning kicks. And it's finally your turn. 
from Stomach Titans when you see Tenza step forward to challenge you. You take a deep breath and flex your fingers. Tenza stands across from you, looking you up and down. He strokes his shoulders a few times and clenches his jaw. You see Izagi standing against the wall behind him. She crosses her chest with one arm and clenches her fist, nodding to you. While Tenza readies himself in his stance, you relax your body and raise your hands. You try your best to control your breathing, but your heart is hammering. Master Zon chops the air, and then it goes silent except for your and Tenza's breathing. You relax your eyes, trying to take all of him in at once. He gets advanced to enter striking range with strong, common strides. His arms strong and stiff. In your unfocused gaze, you realize some of the thing about his form seems slightly off. Dozens of tiny lessons from Zagi tell you he's too rigid. You take one step toward him. This is how Zagi taught you. And you see him hesitate. You step back before you can complete the move. He's been watching Zagi teach me. Bam. Tenza inches closer after your step, clearly wary. At the same time, you can sense him preparing to make his own move. You can see it in the way he stands, preparing to throw out a kick, and he's struggling to get his balance just right. Before he can even finish thinking, your back leg swings forward and diagonally to Tenza's right side. Here the leg comes forward, throwing you straight toward Tenza. The two step. Hard to counter if you've never seen it. You see Tenzo's body tense as he breathes in sharply. His eyes are trying to focus on your footwork. He's too slow to make a move in time. You end the step with your face six inches from his and the leading arm is sliding on top of his. Your leading arm presses his guard down and your back hand comes forward to punch him squarely in the cheek. Tenza's head snaps back and one of his arms flies forward in a clumsy, blind punch then misses your face. While he's still reeling, you step between his legs and bring up your elbow to strike him in the temple. The blow lands on the crown of his skull and you feel his, start, his stance break as he stumbles backward. Salizam um, barks to stop. You see Tenza's tight, fierce face looking back at you. And in that split second, you can tell he's thinking of ignoring the order. Good form, good initiation, Uzo. Back you to the syllabus. Master the course material first. I won't tell you again. Tenzo. Strong form, good movement, but your stance is too stiff. Relax your muscles and you will be much faster next time. Both of you advance next level of training. Let's step back to the wall. You bow to Izan, then to Tenza, then go back to the wall. Across the room, you spot Izagi beaming at you. Tenza, meanwhile, is taking long, slow, deep breaths, staring at you. When he sees you looking at him, he shakes his head back and forth slowly with a sardonic smile. Eventually, the junior sparring matches are over, and Izan begins calling for the senior students. When the pair, first pair faces one another, you're shocked. The match lasts almost two minutes, but the students trade dozens of blows. He's on paces around the periphery of the fight, watching from every angle. The fight is hard and brutal, but neither one backing down or retreating. By the time it's over, both students' faces are bruised and bloodied. Master Izan approaches them and gives his normal bridge speeches, then sends them back to the wall where they stand battered and panting. That's not sparring, that's blood sport. That's practice, I don't want to see what a real fight is. The next fight is no less bloody. One of the other senior students seems to focus on acrobatic rolls and leaps, but their opponent manages to catch them off balance. The acrobatic student is knocked off with a quick step by a spinning kick, and watches for a tense half minute as they try desperately to defend out their opponent's grapples. When the zombie stops the match, the acrobat is pounding the floor in a chokehold. Now, let's see here. Initiate Ito, you're next. A lump forms in your stomach as Izagi steps forward. As fierce as she is, she can't help but worry. 
She looks as determined as ever, staring steely-eyed at the rest of the room. No one steps forward. May I remind your students? Ah. A girl wearing a red sash steps away from the wall. You recognize her as the one whose arm was in the sling when you first arrived, Eno. Marasty Zam steps away from the center of the room as Eno takes up her position and bows. Izagi bows back and slips into her stance. The match starts and Izagi immediately plunges in the striking range, scoring a glancing blow on Eno. Unlike other students, Izagi seems to throw her entire weight behind her when she moves, like she's catapulting herself at her opponent. As the seconds pass, Izagi keeps pressing the attack, never leveling up for an instant. Each blow seamlessly chains into the next, and everyone is precise and powerful. You realize in shock that everything you've been doing in Izagi must seem hopelessly slow and elementary compared to this. The grace of removance is an order of magnitude above your own, and you feel yourself laugh at how easy, how simple she makes it look. You know, meanwhile, can only seem to weather the onslaught. Can't remember if she's thrown a single punch, but she's taken plenty. Ino seems perpetually on the brink of being overwhelmed, but never actually breaks. Instead, she st stalwartly blocks and retreats. In response, Izagi's style shifts and becomes more exotic, with strange snake-like jabs and movements that seem more for show than impact. She's not for Izan. She's not even trying to beat her opponent anymore. Watching Izagi is mesmerizing, but you feel uneasiness creep into her gut again as you watch Ino doggedly refuse to give up. What is she waiting for? See Ino's eyes rapidly flicker between the Izagi's hands, legs, and face. You realize her irises are slithered like a hawk's. You watch Izagi fully extend her arm to deliver a palm strike to Ino's forehead, and a flash, Ino's hand flies forward. In one fluid movement, Ino's hand slices through Izagi's arm at the elbow, sending Izagi's severed forearm tumbling to the floor. Izagi lets out a shriek of anger and surprise, then drives her other hand forward in the point-blank strike to Ino's eyes. Without hesitating, Ino's other hand darts forward. The edge of her palm cuts straight through Izagi's flesh and bone, and the Izagi's other arm drops the floor with a wet thud. Izagi collapses to her knees, screaming. You see dark red stains begin to bloom across the sleeves of her uniform as Ino steps away. Watching the horror as Ino drops to her knees next to Izagi, raising one hand against Izagi's thigh and chops off her leg below the knee. Izagi's screaming rises by an octave, and Ino stands up and slowly moves around Izagi before leaning down to next to the other leg. You look helplessly toward the other students, then toward Izam. No one is saying a word, they're just watching silently, expressionless. The edge of Ino's palm comes down on Izagi's other leg, and you hear the sound of flesh separating like a butcher cutting into a side of meat. Ino stands up and walks back to her place on the wall, smirking. You look toward Izagi, who's now on her back. She's lying in a pool of blood, with her limbs surrounding her. You can see her long, dark hair spread across the floor of the messy fan. Your classmates begin to filter out the dojo, casting glances backward. One by one, they turn away and head out the door. You stand where you are, silently looking at the pool of blood slowly spreading across the floor. You walk closer, listening to Izagi's ragged breathing and quiet whimpers. Izam walks forward too. He kneels down next to her and begins pressing the several limbs to Izagi's thumbs while muttering. You blink and suddenly Izagi's arms and legs are reattached. Wait, he couldn't. You're dismissed, Uzo. I don't need an audience for this. Is she going to be okay? Are her arms both broken? Two clean fractures, no shattering. Excellent work by Initiate Gehera. 
Kenichi Ito here will be hard pressed these next two, three weeks. Izagi looks up at you with red, watery eyes. Her face is contorted in pain, and every movement seems to send spasm up her body. Just go! She squeezes the words through gritted teeth, staring right into your eyes. Don't move. They're trying to think of something to do to cover her. They can't think of anything. Just go! She was loud enough to make you flinch, even taking an involuntary step back. Go on, Uzo. I got it under control here. Have a good weekend, then. Leave her to me. You nod and take three more reluctant steps back, then turn around and walk slowly toward the door. Behind you, you can hear Izagi sobbing. 